These shows are made possible through the combined efforts of Shelby County Schools and GHS-TV. The shows are hosted by the members of the community and utilize the staff and facilities of Germantown High School. If you would like to watch our live stream or get more information about these shows, log on to our website, ghstv.org. Thank you, and we hope you enjoy the following presentation. Welcome to Living Well. I'm William Kinley. Sepsis is a life-threatening illness that can occur when the entire body reacts to an infection. Every year, over 250,000 Americans die from sepsis. It's very important to catch this illness early. General Surgeon Mark Miller is here with us today. He performs a number of procedures at Methodist Labonner Germantown Hospital. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. We're glad to have you. So I guess a good place to start, what is sepsis? Well, there was an old term used years ago, it used to call blood poisoning. And it's, it's obviously evolved to the body's overwhelming and, and uh, life-threatening response to an infection. Okay, okay, so it's, it's the result of something else. Yes, yes. Okay, uh, how does someone get sepsis? Well, it, it can be a, a, a whole host of things. It can be from a minor scratch to a, a life-threatening trauma, to a, a, a surgical injury, to uh, an older person having pneumonia, a younger person having appendicitis, uh, diverticulitis, just any kind of infection that can go beyond the normal and it can cause a patient to be uh, quite sick. Okay. Uh, we've heard the term septic shock before. Can you help us understand the difference between yeah. sepsis and you septic shock? You know, sepsis shock? begins off as, you know, somebody who's gotten maybe a fever, you know, his heart rate's up, something is going on that he looks like he's got the flu. That myriad of changes goes further to the point where you get organ dysfunction, uh, respiratory compromise, acidosis, and then hypotension, which is the term for septic shock. It's when the blood pressure starts to fall and the patient is really, really in danger. Okay, so it's the progression of sepsis, is that fair? Progression, that's correct. Uh, who's at risk for developing sepsis? <laughs> that's a good question. You know, the, the usual people that are at risk are the immunocompromised, the mm -hmm. elderly, the very young, but really anybody that, you know, the diabetic, the person who has uh, an ongoing uh, medical problem, but anybody can get sepsis. So are there things that we can do to reduce our risk? Yeah, that's, you know, there's always the, the good stay healthy, and that's the reason mm -hmm. to, to keep from getting sepsis. But the diabetic keeps his diabetes under control. The cancer patient is aware of other people that are sick, so he's not exposed. The, the regular person who eats well, takes good care of himself, stays hydrated, and tries to avoid uh, illness. So is it, is it fair to say that any infection that you might have could develop on into sepsis? That's, that's correct. You know, most of the time, primarily people get sick, they get well. The body mm -hmm. does most of the work for us. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it needs a little help with some antibiotics, but there's those people who really get sick, and then once they fall down that path of sepsis, they can, they can really in trouble. Well, you mentioned antibiotics. How do you balance, you know, there's a, an encouragement that a lot of things we have are not responsive in, to antibiotics, and we use as a, as a country too many antibiotics. Sure, sure. How do you balance that sore throat, <laughs> ear infection, do you, do you not? Yeah, that's a dilemma, and that's one of those things that the pediatricians who are the, the people who are up in the front lines have to deal with that mostly because you've got a mom that wants the antibiotics. Well, most of those diseases can be a result of viruses, so you've got to temper that. But when you come to somebody who's got a, an injury or a diabetic that's got a foot infection or somebody who's got abdominal pain from diverticulitis or just an appendicitis, that's different. So that's when you really start using the antibiotics. So those are some of the things that you treat. It might have been good to ask you just kind of to cover the waterfront of what you do treat <laughs> well, as a general surgeon. <laughs> well, I'm a general surgeon, and, and primarily I operate on the abdomen and the contents. Uh, I do colon resections. A appendicitis, hernia repairs, gallbladder surgery, stomach surgery, things like that. So when you're called and if there's an infected site or an organ, you, you know that. Yes, I mean, we're trained to, to look at the patient, to examine the abdomen, to see the, the potential, you know, 
calamity that's come before the patient. Well, that kind of leads into my next question, and you've talked a little bit about this, but symptoms of sepsis. Well, you know, it, it can begin with just the mere fact that the patient has a temperature, a little elevation temperature, the heart rate's going up a little bit, their respiratory rate's going a little bit, their white count can be elevated. Of course, in, in certain sepsises, the white count can be falling, which is a bad sign, along with the temperature being falling, and that's a bad sign. But those are the early symptoms. So as a physician and you're seeing these things, you have to bring it all together? Absolutely. Well, it, it's, you know, you have to be aware. You have to be thinking about what if this is going to go to the next level. So uh, it sounds like it could be challenging to diagnose. It is. I mean, you know, a lot of people get sick. A lot of people have the flu-like symptoms. A lot of people have, you know, the, the common things. You know, they got a little scrape. But after you see them progress, you start seeing their, their countenance change, their color changes. You know, they're, they're getting sick, and you can see it. Okay. But it's hard okay. to determine that. I mean, they could just be having the run-of-the-mill flu and look like very sick, but, you know, sepsis is kind of hard to treat. Yeah, we want to be very specific in our society. Absolutely. We want a, a lab test, and then we want a specific <laughs> drug to fix it. <laughs> Absolutely. So there isn't, like, run the sepsis test on that. I know. it. I wish there was a sepsis test. Is there a battery of things that you look at? Well, I mean, like I said, those things that, you know, you check the white count, and you check the patient's, you know, vital signs, their, their respiratory rate, their heart rate, their temperature, all those things kind of clue you in. If they're elevated, then you're more alert to the thinking that they may be going down that path of sepsis. I see. Can you talk about time? I know I mentioned in the beginning that uh, how important time is. So it's not just about diagnosing, but it's, a, it's about diagnosing and starting something quickly. Absolutely. And, you know, we don't want everybody to rush to the emergency room because they think they're getting septic. But you know, you do have to be aware of those things. And, you know, those simple things to, to alert the lay public to say, hey, I need to go see my doctor or I need to go to the emergency room, then they can take it from there. Okay. So, so early detection or early awareness and, you know, be proactive. So take us through a, a, a patient comes to, to, to your hospital, comes in, there's been a diagnosis. Uh, kind of where do, we, where do we go? Well, the hallmarks, it's an emergency, so you are giving them fluids right off the bat. You're giving them antibiotics. And a lot of times we hit them with broad spectrum antibiotics to cover everything until we know specifically what we're treating or what bug we're treating. But okay. those are the hallmarks. And then you support the patient. If their blood pressure is going down, there are obviously their pressure agents that we can use to help support the blood pressure. That helps the body maintain uh, the perfusion of organs, which can be So when become you say, I'm going to cut you off, but when you say pressure agents, what do you mean? Well, I mean, you know, there, there are drugs that we give that help constrict the blood vessels that are being dilated by the toxins or the, the, the sepsis. There are agents to help support the heart, to help the heart, you know, pump more efficiently and better. And you mentioned fluids. Why is that important? Well, the body will need fluids to maintain its blood pressure. And a lot of times with sepsis, their blood pressure is starting to fall and they can be at jeopardy for all of a sudden, once their pressure falls to a critical level, you, you can't get them back. So you want to maintain fluid. We have to, to get them hydrated to keep them alive, so to speak. I see. So that kind of gets you to the point then that you would actually start treating the source, I guess. Right, well, that's or the- Or identifying yeah, the source. Absolutely, you know, identifying the source. Obviously, if they've got appendicitis, you take them to surgery and remove the appendix. Boom, you fix them. But there are other diseases that you really can't just fix, you know, perforated colon, a lot of times you have to do surgery, but sometimes you can treat medically to get them back out of that septic position on forward to where you can treat them more appropriately. Well, it's time for a quick break. Up next, we'll talk more about how to treat sepsis and what to expect during and after recovery. Stay with us. Welcome to Germantown High School an international baccalaureate creative and performing arts optional school, a destination school for students who are going places. Our students are of the highest caliber when it comes to their academics and knowledge. The IB program is a very rigorous program. You were challenged in a way that you thought you couldn't be challenged. You succeeded something that other kids may not have thought they could do. They're accepted to colleges that are just I mean, dream colleges for so many people. Germantown High School offers a CAPA program, the Creative and Performing Arts program. When I first came here, I saw the television studio and I was just amazed at what all I saw. Kids do everything, that they're taught every detail 
that has to do with theater arts and creative arts. I love a lot of things about Germantown High School, but primarily what I love is the athletics. There's something exciting around every single corner. We probably are one of the most diverse high schools in the state of Tennessee, maybe the United States. I would never doubt about sending your child to Germantown High School. This high school is something not like any other high school that we have. There's definitely fun in the work. We find fun in everything we do. You're watching the award-winning GHS TV, a nationally recognized student television station. Welcome back. We're talking with surgeon Dr. Mark Miller about sepsis. So we talked a lot about identifying sepsis in the first segment. Now we're going to talk a little more about what you do then and the treatment of sepsis. So let's kind of take it up from there. All right. Well, when a patient is deemed to be septic, you know, you're already on an emergency uh, protocol. The patient's going to get fluids, antibiotics, broad coverage of antibiotics are used just to, to kind of shotgun approach to make sure that we cover everything that could possibly be going on. And then once we kind of settle down to figure out where the source is, then we, you know, can home the specific antibiotic for the specific bug that we're treating. But you know, sepsis can be from a lot of things, so the treatment is primarily directed to what's causing the sepsis. I if see. If a diabetic comes in with a bad foot, a, an infected diabetic foot, then we treat that. We may take the person to surgery to debride, to wash, to clean, and get the infection under control. Intraabdominal sepsis is what I see mostly because I'm a surgeon. Then I'm going in the abdomen to take care of that, whether it's a perforated colon, an appendicitis, perforated ulcer. There are a lot of things like that that I treat. Dr. Miller, I know there's a lot of discussion and, and we hear about uh, antibiotic resistant organism, organisms now. Uh, I suspect you probably run upon that as well. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that and how uh, we can help protect ourselves against that? Yeah, that's, that's, that's going to be an ongoing problem because the bugs are smart. They, they know how to adapt. We can find a, an antibiotic to treat an organism and we overuse that antibiotic and all of a sudden that organism figures it out and he mutates and becomes resistant to that. So we're seeing a lot of resistance over the time come about. And that's something that, you know, you treat the patient appropriately. You try to not use antibiotics when it's not really indicated. And if you do that, hopefully we can kind of stay ahead of it. I see, I see. So it, it does make it more difficult, I guess. It, it reduces your arsenal? Absolutely. We've got some resistant bugs that when we see those, it's very, very terrifying because sometimes we don't have that magic bullet to treat it. And, and it can be devastating to the patient. You talked some in the first segment about how, uh, how, you, how we can help prevent sepsis on, on our own. Are there specific instances uh, beyond that you'd like to share? Well, I mean, it, it's just basically common sense. We, we can't prevent an appendicitis. That just happens. I right. wish we could, then we would not have that. Uh, diverticulitis, we all have diverticular disease as we get older. Eating healthy, high fiber diets, things like that can mm -hmm. help that. Uh, you know, a simple scratch, fall down, you know, that's going to happen. But cleaning the wound, being proactive to prevent something that starts out as small to progress to something that can be life-threatening. So just being mindful and staying healthy. Absolutely. Fifty percent of people who survive sepsis experience post-sepsis syndrome. What is that? Well, that's, it's akin to sound like a post-traumatic syndrome. <clears throat> people who've had a life-threatening injury, they've been in the ICU, they've been sick, they've been on a ventilator, they've been really, really close to death. Those people post-recovery you know, post can have some mental slow slowness, they can have muscle aches, fatigue, they can have uh, insomnia, inability to get to sleep, inability to stay asleep, hallucinations, a whole host of things. and it's real difficult for for somebody that has that to to be able to treat them but you know what is causing it I don't really know and I don't know if anybody knows but just the stress to the body can disrupt a lot of things and stress in itself is is a disruptive uh, thing I see so just the uh, the trauma of the experience correct wow that's a uh, that's tough have you had patients to work through that Sure, I mean, you, you really don't know who's going to be affected the most. You know, I see a lot of people who are just totally healthy and all of a sudden they become sick. And they can have a hard time getting over it. It's tough. And they, they're emotional. They have, you know, fatigue, you know, mental clarity issues, things like that. But it, you know, with time, we can work and get through it. That's good to know. Yeah. That's good to know. How can we learn more about sepsis? Well, there's a 
you know, the CDC is always coming out with new things, and I think they've just come out with some new guidelines, which is good. The uh, sepsis.org is a good website to go to and just kind of read about it, and the layperson can, can go through that and see what's going on. Well, while we have you here, and we, we've talked about sepsis, if there's more things you'd like to share, but I'd like to hear just more of, of your practice. You've practiced in this community for a long time as a general surgeon. Uh, tell us about your practice here. I think our audience will be interested to hear. <laughs> well, I've been here for 29 years in private practice. Uh, I've been working with Methodists all that time. Uh, I've had uh, a myriad of cases, and it's, you know, there's always those interesting cases, which I never want to be an interesting case. I just <laughs> want to clear that. Uh, but the, the day can change from just being a boring day to something that is just very scary. And uh, from just walking along and all of a sudden you have somebody come into the emergency room who's septic, who's sick, who's got to be resuscitated. You know, you do that and then you have to go from there. So it's not something that you can plan your day over. I see. Have you seen your practice change in 29 years? Oh, gosh. I think I'm seeing more sick people than I've ever seen. I don't know if that's... Really? Yes. Uh, I think that we're living longer. We're maintaining our longevity with, with just the, the fact that we have a better quality of life. But as we grow older, you are going to get sick and things can be more serious as that time, as that time goes on. How about surgical techniques? How's that changed? Oh, that's... You know, I'm a gadget guy. I love to see new things come along. We've we've come from, you know, just basically cutting somebody open and reaching our hands in there to, to see what's wrong. Now now we have robotics and we can, I can sit over in the corner on a comfortable chair and actually operate on the abdomen, you know, 20 feet away. So it's it's come a long way, and it's and it's fun to see the new things come along. How are some of those things beneficial to your patients? Well, you know, we've gone from making large incisions to small incisions to to open surgery to minimally invasive surgery so the minimally invasive surgery that accomplishes the same goals of open surgery is so much better for the patient they can return to work sooner they have less pain and they're a lot happier when i see them back in the office how uh how do you work with other specialties in the hospital i know you work closely with anesthesia particularly right. on post-surgical right. pain and recovery well, I must say that what I do is a team event. Without my nurses, my associates, my people who you know clean the operating room, the people who take patients from the floor to the x-ray, I couldn't do what I do without them. So it's, it's a team approach, and I have colleagues, and we work together. We like to talk about things, and it's nice to know what they're doing so they know what I'm doing, and we all be on the same page. And I think that's what, what your patients really expect. Absolutely. Still to come, meet a woman who has written a book about surviving sepsis. She'll share her family's experience with us right after this quick break. Welcome back. Author and CEO Amy Howe joins us to share her family's experience with sepsis. Amy, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for We're having glad me. Glad to have you here. Thank you. Uh, tell us about you and your family's story. Well, I've talked about it for so long and I've also kept a lot of notes and so I've written this new book, Healing in High Gear, which is a thir my third book about our family's experience. And if it weren't for this man right here and Methodist Hospital, we probably wouldn't be sitting here. Well, uh, you're, you're very kind. You're very kind. I know I've read your book, and I was honored to be, uh, to be asked if uh, you'd asked me to do that. And it's a, it's a wonderful guide and a wonderful resource for, for folks that, you know, God forbid none of us want to go through that experience. But if we do, uh, yes. it's a great guide to help for that. How important is it for patients to have an advocate? 
Well, it's critical, and in our case, it was certainly critical. And I had never really heard of sepsis. I knew I knew the term septic shock, but here we we went in for a routine surgical procedure that was a, a colon resection for diverticulitis. My husband had it, and what should have uh, been simple turned into sepsis. So for whatever reason, so. We had to get Dr. Miller engaged to go back in and do emergency surgery, not only once, but twice. And uh, so that was in 2015, January, and uh, my husband has just finally had his final surgery to put him back together. Dr. Miller did it in June. So we have been at this now for a year and a half. And it's wow. important, I know that wasn't your question, but uh, patient advocacy, if I had not been there to jump in and kind of figure out what was going on, Jim would not be here. He would have been, Dr. Miller can, Jim was on a, on a scale of one to 10, Jim was a 12. Yeah. Is that right? That's correct, he was, he was there. So what was it like the day that you got called in? Well, you, you, you never really are prepared to you know, get these calls, but all of a sudden you get them, you go, well, you know, I, something's got to be done. I mean, it's not something, well, let me think about that and push it to the side and I'll come back tomorrow. It, it had to be done right then, so, you know, I'm trained to know what to do. I've, I've got to go in and do something to fix what's wrong because he is going down and he's not going to get any better without an intervention. So that's what I do. I see. Now, I remember uh, you talking with, with me, Amy, and it kind of step away from the clinical piece from the moment, and kudos to Dr. Miller. But can you talk about the communication that the two of you had together and the clarity yes. around that? Yes, yes. Um, I knew I needed a surgeon that I could communicate with quickly, and we were going to have – we were gonna have to change horses if we were in for the long ride. So when I met Dr. Miller and he agreed to take the case, well, first of all, he wears cowboy boots. So I liked him right off the bat. <laughs> he came walking up to us wearing his cowboy boots and he said, you know, your husband's in bad shape. And, you know, I like to tell my patients the truth and I'm a straight shooter. Those were his words and those are in the book. He said, I like to tell my patients the truth and your husband's not gonna make it if we don't go in and do emergency surgery and we gotta do it today. So immediately I liked him. He gave me, he gave me his cell number and I, my job is not to blow up his phone. So. I knew he would be a good surgeon, not only because he was a great surgeon, but he was also a very good communicator. And you can't be at, you can't be engaged as an advocate if you don't have that. Right, right. And, and you want communication, you want clarity, you want the truth. Right. Um, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. What tips do you have for juggling? I mean, you were juggling a lot of things through these 18 months. And I still am. And so I think Dr. Miller alluded to the fact that post sepsis and post septic shock there are a lot of issues that you deal with as a family, as I mean, when something so tragic and so critical happens to one person, it happens to the family. Sure. So my son at the time was a senior in high school. We were in the midst of trying to figure out, you know, where he was gonna go to college. And my daughter is now a junior in high school. So my kids were at home and they were great. They stepped up. We spent over a hundred days in the hospital. Like 35 of those were in ICU, uh, five surgeries and the ventilator twice, a tracheostomy. So it was serious stuff. and. You know, it's important to, um, and that's what we talk about in the book, you know, how do you handle your finances? How do you handle, I have a marketing and PR firm. I had to keep working. My team had to, you know, answer the bell every day. Right. So I had to pay bills. I had to find out, you know, Jim paid a lot of our bills and I had to find out where they were. And, you know, it was, it was very stressful. So it's, a, it's, it's not been, I mean, I feel like if I can survive the last two years, I can survive anything. <laughs> Any tips for trying to be prepared if in, in fact your family found yourself in that situation? This book has 13 chapters in it. Uh, the first chapter is what happened to us, and then all the other chapters are helpful guides on different topics like your fin your finances, mm -hmm. um, what to do before you have a surgery. It's a, there's a checklist in here. There's a checklist in here about sepsis. What is sepsis? How do you detect it? What does it look like? And shortly after I helped my husband, I also helped my dad. He, he had a, Dr. Miller did a gallbladder surgery. The EMTs were trying to take my dad to St. Francis and treat him for stroke. They missed it. So, you know, we have to do a better job. And, you know, there are only two states in our country who have adopted septic protocols, mandated it, Illinois and New York, because so many people died is the largest killer in the hospitals. So we have mm -hmm. to do a better job detecting sepsis and right. diagnosing it. Because right. once you're septic, you're critical. And quickly, as, uh, as Dr. Miller shared with us. Yes. Uh, why did you decide to write a book? Well, it's my third book. My first book is Women in High Gear. It's about women entrepreneurs. My second book, the women that read it said, please write one for our kids because they don't know how to get out of college and they don't, they're in debt. So we wrote Students in High Gear. And then when this happened, you know, I had my computer with me all the time at the hospital. So I just started taking notes and thought this would be a good, you know, catharsis for me and it helped. And this is really meant to help other people. I see. 
but it sounds like it helped you as you went through the process as well. Right, and if we can avoid, um, if, if I can help, if someone can read this book and they can say, okay, that's how I would deal with the hospital system and that's how I would deal with a sick person, then it's been worth it. So you said your husband had three surgeries? No, five. Five surgeries in total. Five total. From January 2015 was the bad surgery and then Dr. Miller did four more. And the last one, he, he had a colostomy bag for 15 months so Dr. Miller and Dr. Chandler, our plastic surgeon, were able to go in and reattach his colon and remove that bag. Very difficult surgery. And it sounds like he has experienced the, the, the post-septic trauma that Dr. Miller talked about as well, or at least some aspects of that. Well, I don't think you can ever be the same after something yeah. like that. You know, mm -hmm. I just don't think, you know, physically certainly he's getting better and stronger, but I just think emotionally, and some of it's good. You know, you use that information to help other people. Sure. All right. It sure. definitely changes your life. Well, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt. Uh, Dr. Miller, what's the most important thing that you want our viewers to, to remember about sepsis? Well, that, that people get sick, they can get sick quickly, to be aware of that and just to be, be proactive and, you know, head to the doctor when you need to. Amy, how about you? Trust your gut. Uh, don't believe everything that you hear. Um, challenge the, I wouldn't challenge Dr. Miller, but I would certainly, my, our experience sheds light on other clinicians that need to be challenged. So I think it, it takes a village to take care of somebody that's that sick. And if you have a clinician or a physician or an EMT that doesn't get it, if you're an advocate, you challenge that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important because it would have, my, my husband would have been dead and for sure, and my father would have been dead. So you mentioned other states that have been more progressive with their structure and with, with even with, with regulations. Yes. How do you see, we, you've already used your experience a lot that's going to help others, but how do you see that growing from here? Okay, I'm glad you asked that question. I just wrote um, Governor Haslam and Commissioner, Health Commissioner Dreisner this week and showed them what New York and the state of Illinois have done to mandate sepsis protocols. And in New York, there was a 12-year-old 12 12 who, was, who was septic and died, unfortunately. And in Illinois, a family that got that done lost their four-year-old. So in each case, this would, these were parents that lost their children due sepsis. So um, I've, I would like to see our state move a little bit faster and adopt the same protocols. And sepsis is, uh, September is Sepsis Awareness Month. It is, that's right. So we'll be bringing more to bear around that. Great, thank you. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Miller. That wraps up our show for today. For more information on this show and other GHS TV shows, please visit ghstv.org, where you can watch live streaming 24 hours a day. You can also check out GHS TV on Facebook and Twitter. I hope that living well will help you and your family lead healthy lives. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.